In this video, we will do a two-sample t-test. Let's go ahead and read the problem. A delivery company is investigating how long it takes drivers to deliver goods from the factory to a port for export. From previous records, 44 randomly selected delivery times along the same route, we're going to call this route A, yield a sample mean of 437.2 minutes and a sample standard deviation of 18.3 minutes. A newly proposed route, Route B has been driven 34 times with a sample mean of 403.5 minutes and a sample standard deviation of 15.6 minutes. Is there evidence the newly proposed route will be faster than the old route on average? Let's calculate a two-sample T procedure using an alpha or significance level of 0.05. So the null and alternative hypothesis for this is H0 is then equal to mu A minus mu b is equal to zero, and the alternative is mu a minus mu b is, of course, greater than zero. Why is this? Because if mu b or the actual average of root b is faster, then the difference will be a positive value. So once we've obtained our null and alternative hypothesis or figured out what this will be, then we should check conditions. So we need to make sure that our two samples are random. In this case, we do have one random sample at least for root A, and for root B, it just says that it was driven 34 times. So perhaps maybe it isn't a random sample, but it's most likely representative. So we're going to say that these conditions are met for now. And we need to have large sample sizes. So specifically that is that each sample size, if we add them together, is greater than 30. So 44 plus 34 is greater than 30 for sure. So this condition is also met. So once we calculate, or once we establish our conditions have been met, then we can calculate our t-test statistic. So our t-test statistic is equal to x bar a minus x bar b minus our claim of mu a minus mu b, all divided by the standard deviation of the estimate or standard error, which is SA squared over NA plus SB squared, or our variance of root B over its sample size. Okay, and we can simply just plug in values to get this. So we get 437.2 minus 403.5 minus our claimed amount, which happens to just be zero, all divided by the square root of 18.3 squared over our sample size of 44 plus 15.6 squared, all divided by the sample size of 34, which equals a numerator value of 33.7 divided by the denominator of 3.84, which gives us a t-test statistic of 8.776. All right, just in general, this is a really large test statistic. So we're probably going to expect to get a small p-value. But in order to find the p-value, we have to have a certain number of degrees of freedom. So we can look this up on our table. So this is where we either calculate the minimum degrees of freedom, which is the conservative approach, or the sadder weight degrees of freedom. Let's go ahead and calculate the sadder weight degrees of freedom. So if we scroll down, recall the Satterweight degrees of freedom is equal to the formula SA squared over NA plus SB squared over NB, all of this squared divided by SA squared over NA, quantity squared divided by NA minus 1 plus SB squared over NB, all squared, divided by NB minus 1. So if we plug in our sample standard deviations and our sample sizes, we should get a numerator value 
of 218.12 and a denominator value of 2.9. This will give us a satter weight degrees of freedom of 75.22. Now if you use software, this is the degrees of freedom your software will use or a calculator. That's what it will use. Now we will always have to round down to a whole number to look at a table and we might even have to compromise a little bit more if our table doesn't actually have those degrees of freedom. So let's go ahead and go to a T table to see our p-value with the satter weight degrees of freedom of 75. <clears throat> if we go to the t-table, we can see that 75 is not actually on the table, so we'll have to round down to 60. This is okay. The reason is, is that if we scroll across this row, we notice that 8.776, our test statistic, is so far off this page that it is going to be a really, really small p-value. Actually, no matter what degrees of freedom we use, this is going to be a relatively small p-value. We did a one-tailed test. It was a one-sided test, so our p-value will be smaller than the smallest p-value that is recorded on this table, which is 0 0.0005. So our p-value is less than 0 0.0005 from the t-table. Now we could have also used the conservative degrees of freedom. Recall this is the minimum between um, the sample sizes minus 1 and we use the smaller value of these two. So this is 44 and this is 33, which essentially would give us a minimum value of 33 degrees of freedom, which we'd have to most likely scroll down to 30 if we're using the t-table. Again, we'd actually get the same p-value because our test statistic was so large. So what does this mean? How can we make a conclusion from this? Basically, because our p-value is so small, there's going to be convincing evidence that the new root is faster than the old root on average. And so we can reject the null hypothesis at the significance level 0 0.05, which is what we use to establish our significance at the beginning. And if we wanted to include a, our t-test statistic of 8.776, we could here in our conclusion, along with the p-value being less than 0 0.005, and our degrees of freedom that were used were really actually 60 using the table. So in addition to this, we should probably also include a confidence interval interpretation because we had a significant result. So if we want to get a four-part conclusion, we should include that in here as well.